Hello. So, some of you may have heard about the leaked Google memo that has been circulating virally around the internet for the last couple of days. That was written by James Damore, who was fired for it last night. And uh, a colleague of his reached out to me and put us together, and so I'm going to talk to James today about exactly what happened and why, and perhaps what should be done about it. So, I'll... So that's what we're going to do, and the interview I had with him, which finished at about 3 o'clock on Tuesday, August 8th, follows immediately after this introduction. Hi everybody, I'm speaking today with James Demore and an unidentified Google employee who wishes to remain anonymous um, for reasons that I think are obvious. And James, last week, put his hand in a blender by circulating an internal memo that I would say has become somewhat infamous. So, James, let's start with, let's start with a bit of discussion about you. T tell us who you are, t about your background, and about what you were doing at Google. I, yes, yeah, so I, I was actually just, you know, I'm really interested in science and psychology and stuff. And then I really liked puzzles, and that's how I got into Google, actually. I did one of their coding competitions. They just recruited me out of that. And so at Google, I was mostly working on uh, search and image and video search in particular. And so what's, tell us about your educational background a bit. Uh, yeah, so I just did a random science and math in undergrad. And I ended up with a degree. I didn't really know what I was going to do, so I, I started doing research at MIT, and then uh, I went to uh, systems biology at Harvard. I initially wanted to work with Martin Novak. He's really great in evolution and game theory, but uh, then I started working on other things. So tell us a bit about systems biology. What, what is that exactly, and what kind of research were you doing at MIT? I, Yes, yeah, so systems biology has many different meanings, but it's ger generally just mathematical biology. And uh, I guess seeing biological systems as a whole rather than just individual molecules. And so I, I like looking at populations, and so my interest in evolution. So why did that make you uh, a viable candidate at Google, do you think? <laughs> Uh, I think they just saw a smart guy that could code. Fair <laughs> enough. Now, you've been there three years, is that correct? But also as an intern before that? Yeah, so about four years total. And so, how would you say you've performed as an employee at Google? Have people been happy with you, or have you been in trouble? Yeah. Or? No, I, I got promoted twice. My last review was uh, the highest possible, superb, which is the top few percentile. So I, it definitely wasn't based on performance that they fired me. And have you enjoyed working at Google? Has it been a good experience? Yeah, I mean, I love Google. That's the horrible part. Like, I've always been the biggest Google fanboy. All like, I've never had an iPhone. I've always tried to convince my friends to use Android and all these different things. And yeah, I mean, this just puts a sour taste in my mouth. Okay, so, so you've got a good educational background. You were interested in things that Google would be interested in. You're a good coder. You've worked with them for a number of years and done an excellent job, and you're pretty pro-Google. That's basically the background. Yeah. Okay, now, last week, you wrote a memo which has attracted a tremendous amount of attention. And in uh -huh. that memo, you, you made a number of claims, and the claims were... And, Please correct me if I've got this, if I'm not summarizing this properly. You were attempting to describe reasons why there might, why a lack of gender parity might exist within Google, for example, and within engineering more broadly, but also in occupations more broadly. And you, yeah. um, you laid out a very elaborated document, and I reviewed it, and as far as I can tell, your opinions are well supported by the relevant psychological science. And I think what I'll do in the description of this video when I link it is 
putting the references so that people can decide for themselves. I want to put up a web page about gender differences in general, but I'll try to hit the highlights for this particular document. So why did you do this? <laughs> uh, yeah, so about a month and a half ago, I went to one of our diversity summits, all of it unrecorded and super secret, and they told me a lot of things that I thought just were not right. Okay, what and, do you mean unrecorded and super secret? Well, I mean, they were telling us about a lot of these potentially illegal practices that they've been doing to try to increase diversity. And what kind of practices? Uh, well, basically treating people differently based on what their race or gender oh, you mean are. Racism. Yeah, <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm, I see. And so, and it was ultra secret and unrecorded in what manner? Uh, yeah, so I mean, most meetings at Google are recorded. Anyone at Google can watch it. We're trying to be really open about everything, except for this. You know, they don't want any paper trail for any of these things. Well, okay, why? Because I think it's illegal. And I mean, as some of the internal polls showed, there were a large percent of people that agreed with me on the document. And so if everyone got to see this stuff, then you know, they would really uh, bring up some criticism. Yeah, but, well, a large number of people in Google and a very large number of well-informed biological scientists, we might also <laughs> add. So I mean, yeah. I was quite, I was quite um, struck by your document, given that you know, it would have been a, a decent document for a well-informed psychologist, research psychologist to write, but you're somewhat of an outsider, but you got the, you got the highlights accurate as far as I'm concerned. So, okay, so you went to this diversity meeting and you weren't happy with the sorts of things that you were being told and with the practices. Is, are, is that both correct? Yeah. And what were you and, being told? Uh, well, so that... I mean, there's a lot of ways in which they pressure people to increase the diversity of their team. And, you know, there's no way to do that besides actually choosing someone based on their race or gender, right? And what do they mean by I, I diversity don't... precisely? Uh, I mean, more women or underrepresented racial minorities. Okay. Now, can I jump in? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would hesitate to say that that's 100% true across 100% of them. Right. So the organization that I'm in, I have not personally seen anything that I would deem cross the line. Um, you know, I personally believe that there are a good amount of synergies to be found if you can combine, you know, slightly different ideologies um, into a room. And that is the, the thesis that some groups are working towards. Um, obviously, there's going to be a distribution of how people follow the rules. Um, and, you know, it's unfortunate to hear that it's, you know, it could be that some people fall to the wrong side of that distribution. But um, that certainly wouldn't, it would not apply to everybody. Well, it's, yeah, certainly also, it's certainly also distressing to hear that there is acceptance of the idea that diversity can be mapped onto race and gender, especially with regards to performance, because there's no evidence for that whatsoever. So, okay, so you went to this meeting and then you, you decided to write this document. And um, how long had you been working on it before you released it? Uh, yeah, so I was doing it like throughout my free time. I, and I just wanted to clarify my thoughts on this. And I really just wanted to be proven wrong because you know, if what I was saying was right, then something bad is happening. And so, you know, about a month ago, I submitted it to feedback to that program. And, you know, I saw that people looked at it, but no one actually said anything. And what sort and of then, feedback did you submit? Uh, I mean, I basically said what I said in the, in the document, and then I linked to the document itself. And so, I actually published this about a month ago. And... It was only after it got viral and then leaked to the news that Google started caring. Okay, so how did it go viral? And, and do you know? And how was it leaked? Uh, yeah, so I, there was a group at Google called Skeptics. And so I was like 
okay, maybe they'll be able to prove me wrong in some way. Like, they're skeptical about things, right? I don't know. I was naive, I guess. And so I sent them a message like, okay, what do you think about this? Is Google in some sort of echo chamber, or am I in an echo chamber? And you know, then it just exploded after that. And you know, our internal, yeah, it was just spread throughout all of Google. Do you and do you know was it the was it was it the skeptics group that started to spread it around? Yeah, and then there were a lot of upper management that uh, you know specifically called it out and started saying how harmful it is and how it's unacceptable. This sort of viewpoint is not allowed at Google. Yeah, what sort of viewpoint exactly? The the idea that there are differences between men and women that actually might play a role in 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 in, in the in the in the corporate world, that that's an opinion that's not acceptable. Yeah, it seems so. Well, but, I mean, and, you know, understandably, it is this these issues are tricky morally and politically. But yeah. the thing that was disturbing to me about watching the response to you is that, as far as I can tell, there isn't anything that you said in that paper. First of all, that is in fact biased in a manner that should open you up to the sorts of charges that have been opened up against you or that violates the scientific literature as it currently stands. So both of those are rather distressing. Yeah, and there's a lot of misrepresentation by upper management just to silence me, I think. Yes, and why is that, do you think? Like, why, why is it that Google couldn't have actually, do you think that Google couldn't have come out and had an intelligent discussion about this instead of, well, first of all, releasing, like Dan, I read Danielle Brown's response to you, which I thought was uh, absolutely appalling, ill-informed <laughs> and appalling. And then yeah. they fired you, which seems to be like a really bad PR move, but more importantly, doesn't actually deal with the issues at hand. You know, they're basically saying something like, well, what was their rationale for firing you exactly? What was the excuse that was given? So the official excuse was that I was perpetuating gender stereotypes. That you were perpetuating gender stereotypes. Yeah. And did they say anything else about your performance or about anything else that you had done? No. It was and, that was the only reason. And who 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 fired you technically? Uh, it was my HR representative and my director. Okay. And do you and do you, do you have any idea on whose orders they were acting or if this was something that they conjured up themselves or I, I'm sure it probably went from higher up than that, because I mean this is a huge PR move, so they yeah. would need approval from right. higher ups. Right, and I think the CEO, the CEO actually made some comments about the issue today, which I'll probably cut into this video as we, as I edit it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, all right. So, the first question is, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. I, there's a lot of messages that I'm trying to sort through and just trying to figure out what I should do now, but... Yeah, you've been given some interesting <laughs> job offers as far as I can tell. <laughs> yeah, I've gotten a surprising amount of support. Yeah. yeah, well, I suspect, in fact, I'm virtually certain that you have a majority viewpoint. It's just that the people who hold the alternative perspective, which are the radical social constructionist types who insist that everything is a consequence of socialization. They're a little bit more organized politically, but they're clearly wrong scientifically. They're wrong factually. They're wrong ethically for that matter. So, so you, you probably have more support than you think, and it'll be very interesting to see how that turns out. So, so yeah. what do you think about having written this? Or, I mean, now your life is going to be turned upside down and for quite a while, I suspect. I mean, so you put yourself out on the line doing this. So mm -hmm. what do you think about that? I, it definitely sucks, but I mean, at least I was proven right, <laughs> you know? When, what do you mean by proven right? Well, just that the whole uh, culture just tries to silence any dissenting view. And that we really need some more objective way of looking at these things. Yeah, well, I felt the same way when the University of Toronto decided to, you know, 
attempt to shut me down after I made my videos. I thought, well, that just proves my point. Yeah. Because I mean, I made the videos saying, well, I don't like the climate that's developing. It, it's making it very difficult to have conversations about certain things. And your example is even more egregious, I think, because, you know, I at least objected to a piece of legislation that in principle would have been of benefit to an identifiable group let's say the uh -huh. transgender group i don't believe it is of any benefit to them but you could make a case that it was but you all you did as far as i can tell is review the modern personality literature and the literature on individual differences relating to men and women and, and other groups and there's actually not very much opinion in your piece at all so what that yeah. means is that it is not possible to actually have a discussion about the scientific literature on these issues without putting yourself at risk. And that's a hell of a thing for an engineer because I mean, engineers and re rely on the facts as far as I can tell. And one of the things I like about engineers is that they, they tend to stick fairly closely to the facts. They're, they're not a very political group, you know, generally speaking. They're much more yeah. practical. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how they can expect to silence so many engineers and intelligent people and just deny science like this. Yeah, well, the question, too, is what are your supporters within Google going to do? Because, you know, I would say you're a great warning, man, because you, you showed what happened to you showed exactly what happens if you have enough, I don't know what you'd call it curiosity and courage I suppose but but mostly curiosity to lay out what you think for discussion I mean even yeah. when you opened this conversation you said that you know you weren't jumping up and down and insisting you were right you were trying to lay out what you understood from doing a fair bit of reading and 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 make the case that the these facts the facts about the differences between men and women and employment choice and, and payment and all that aren't being discussed and they're not being discussed. I mean, we know, yeah. for example, and I'll put this citation in the, in the description, it's been very difficult for the, the Swedes, for example, to flatten out the gender distribution for engineers mm -hmm. in Sweden and in, and, in, and in the Scandinavian countries in general, despite their advanced social engineering, let's call it. And they also can't get male nurses. You know, I think it's uh -huh. four out of five nurses in, in Scandinavia, if I remember correctly, are female and the reverse number are, are engineers are male. And, you know, that seems to be associated with this quite well-founded um, scientific observation that women tilt towards interest in people and men tilt towards interest in things and that that's associated with testosterone exposure in utero. This is yeah. solid science, you know, and it, <laughs> and it isn't anybody beating an ideological drum because most of the people, I would say that most of the people who are publishing this would have been even happier had it turned out the other way. You know, the, uh -huh. the findings actually run contrary to their biases because academia is generally full of people whose biases are left. And now and then, you know, scientific findings emerge to dispute um, an ideological proposition. That was certainly the case with the role of biology versus society in, in establishing gender differences. So the science is very credible. It doesn't mean it's completely beyond dispute, but that's not the point either, because your survey was actually a pretty decent survey of the current state of affairs with regards to individual differences. That doesn't mean yeah. it's right. So, okay, so what, what, are your, what, are your, what does your family think about all this? <laughs> Yeah, they definitely support me, but they they don't really know what I should do from here. They they don't want me to, you know, just go to a ton of news corporations and do all these interviews and stuff. And because they just want to twist whatever I say towards their agenda too. It's it's not really clear what I should be doing. Yeah, well, there's certainly no shortage of people that want to talk to you. I mean, I've been contacted by four or five journalists who would like to speak with you. Um, we can talk about that afterwards. I can let you know who they are. But um, yeah, well, you've got a you've got a conundrum on your hands. You no, know, I mean you're you're a you're a very straightforward person, and you're obviously not grinding any axe, at least not in any obvious way. So my suspicions are that 
talking to the right people could be of substantial use to you, but I guess it also depends on what it is that you want. I mean, and that's something we could talk about. Now, you've, you've, you've rattled up the cages of a fair number yeah. of people and a fairly large organization. Interestingly enough, just on the heels of Google and YouTube's announcement about their new free speech restrictions on, on YouTube, you know, and, and their incorporation of NGOs into that censorship process. So it's been quite a week for Google, I would say. So you've opened up this can of worms. What is mm -hmm. it? That, so imagine if you're looking six months down the road, say, and things happened that were good because of what you did. What is it that you would like to have happen? Uh, I, at the very least, I want, because I, I do still care about Google, I want some conversation to be had and for the ideologues to not just have their way. But yeah, I, I still don't have a clear vision on how exactly this will happen and yeah, well, how, how this can spread farther than just Google. Well, I mean, you've spread it farther than just Google, that's for sure. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, I would say my experience is with the press is that the first thing that happens that will happen is that you'll get jumped on by people who call you the sorts of epithets that would be appropriate if you were a bad guy and you should just shut up and go away. Okay, yeah. and that's already happened. But I think you're going to get through that real quick because I went through your... Um, your writings, which are not a screed, by the way, and are certainly not an anti-diversity screed. I went yeah. through your writings, and, and I can't see anything there that identifies you as the sort of person that can be easily and permanently tarred with a hateful epithet. But, you know, it's logical for the public, let's say, including the media, to jump on someone like you when they blow a whistle, because the first thing that you might presume if someone's causing trouble is that there's something wrong with them. And so then you have to sort of beat them a while with the idea that there's something wrong with them to see what happens. And so the first thing is you have to withstand that. But there don't seem to be any smoking pistols in your background. So, for example, you were an, an ideal Google employee. Well, that protects you a lot. And, and you don't have a history of, this, of any sort of troublemaking. And you have a solid educational background. And you're clearly a reasonable person. And so the first thing is, is just to steel yourself to get through that. And then what uh -huh. will happen, I think, if you do talk to media organizations, and especially if you talk to them the way that you're talking to me, which is extraordinarily calm and composed, then you're going to reveal yourself even more as a reasonable person. And the press overall will start to shift behind you. And I think the reason for that is one thing you've got to remember about the press is that when push comes to shove, they're actually rather in favor of free speech. Yeah. Given that without it, they would be dead. <laughs> so I don't think, like, I don't think that you have to worry about being exploited and twisted by media sources. I actually think that it might be to your advantage to talk to people. You know, you can figure out who those people are, but you're just not the kind of person that can be easily transformed into a villain. And the more that you can demonstrate that, the better it might be, you know, for, mm -hmm. for the cause that you're engaged in, but also for yourself. Yeah. So what, so like, how are you feeling about this emotionally? You must be in a bit of a state of shock, I would think. <laughs> yeah, it's been a stressful week, for sure. Uh, but... I, I'm not feeling too negative about it yet. I, it hasn't fully hit me, I don't think. Yeah, well, it won't, because God only knows what's going to happen to you over the next few weeks, right? It's going to be a real roller coaster. And, yeah. you, know, you, you know, the other thing that you might consider is that it's possible that this will turn out extraordinarily positive for you. You know, there's going to be, it's going to be a rough ride, but um, to the degree that you are accurate in your observations, then, you know, it's not that easy to... It's not that easy for the opponents of truth to have a battle with truth. It's not easy to have a battle yeah. with reality, you know, you, you tend to lose. So, can Definitely. I just go over some of the things that you said so that we can discuss them? Yeah, sure. 
Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to take a look here. So you started with a pretty good, solid statement, I would say. Google's political bias has equated the freedom from offense with psychological safety, but shaming into silence is the antithesis of psychological safety. Well, that seems even more relevant now in your situation. Yeah. <laughs> the silencing has created an ideological echo chamber where some ideas are too sacred to be honestly discussed. Well, we can check that one off too, right? Your firing <laughs> certainly seems to indicate that was the case. The lack of dis yeah. discussion fosters the most extreme and authoritarian elements of this ideology. Some of the extreme, the extreme is all disparities in representation are due to oppression. That's a good one, right? That's a univariate yeah. hypothesis. It's very, very simple-minded. Mm -hmm. And then the authoritarian element you defined as the idea we should discriminate to correct for this oppression. Great. And then you make a claim. Dis difference in distributions of traits between men and women may, in part, explain why we don't have 50% representation of women in tech and leadership. Discrimination to reach equal representation is unfair, divisive, and bad for business. Okay, so that's your thesis, and then you go uh. along and try to uh, justify it. So the first thing you do is talk about left-wing versus right-wing biases, and I should point out that you don't concentrate on the left biases or on the right biases. You're completely even-handed with regards to laying out the pros and cons. So the left yeah. is compassion for the weak, disparities are due to injustices, humans are inherently cooperative, change is good, slash unstable, open and idealistic. Fair enough, man. You're dead on with regards to the relevant psychological literature, where we see mm -hmm. that political correctness is motivated by agreeableness, and that liberalism is fundamentally predicted by openness. Mm -hmm. And the right biases, respect for authority, disparities are natural and just, humans are inherently competitive, Change is dangerous, stable, that would be high conscientiousness and low openness, and they're closed rather than open, and pragmatic rather than idealist. Yeah, well, I don't think any reasonable person could read that column and say that you were coming down hard on the side of either part of the political spectrum. Yeah. Dr. Peterson, can I jump in with a question? Um, it appears from my interactions with many people that they are projecting words that were not written onto the paper and would you be able to elaborate on the schemas that people develop and how they classify information um, in their minds um, because this is very much how stereotypes form i would think um, is by kind of just grouping a bunch of disparate but semi-related people or things together and then projecting an idea that may or may not pertain to that yeah well it's a it's a low resolution thought issue. I mean, what, what's happened to James is that he, you know, he, he, he put up his hand and said, wait a second, I don't agree with the diversity ideology, and he was immediately classified essentially as a misogynist and bigot. And that's the simplest yeah. thing to do, right, because misogynists and bigots will hold viewpoints that are anti-female and racist. And so it's a lot easier just to paint someone with a broad brush especially if they're violating the tenets of your implicit um, temperament, let's say, than it is to d dive into the details where real thought occurs. And I think one of the sins that James committed was that he actually dared to make this about details rather than about vague, hand-waving ideology. That's very annoying to people who don't want to think, because... <laughs> In order to analyze his claims, you'd have to go through, well, let's say, 20 or 30 scientific papers and actually understand what they mean. And that's very annoying, especially if you're pursuing a given agenda. So, okay, so then you say neither side is 100% correct, and both viewpoints are necessary for a functioning society, or in this case, company. Yeah, well, I think the data is solid there, too. I mean, our research has indicated that open people who are primarily liberals start companies and the more closed people, the conservatives, the traditionalists are good at running them. They're better at yeah. being managers and, in, and administrators, and that's associated with high conscientiousness. So you've got it right there. A company too far to the right may be too slow to react, over hierarchical and untrusted. And a company too far to the left will be will over diversify its interests, overly trust its employees and competitors, and change perhaps too rapidly. Yeah, great, fine, perfect, nicely balanced as far as I can tell. Only facts and reasons can shed light on these biases. 
But when it comes to diversity and inclusion, Google's left bias has created a politically correct monoculture that maintains its hold by shaming dissenters into silence. Well, that <laughs> certainly seems to be the case. Yeah. Okay, this silence removes any checks against encroaching extremist and authoritarian policies. All right. At Google, we're regularly told that implicit, unconscious, and explicit biases are holding women back in tech and leadership. Of course, men and women experience bias, tech, and the workplace differently, and we should be cognizant of that, but it's far from the whole story. On average, men and women biologically differ in many ways. These aren't just socially constructed, because they're universal across cultures, clear biological causes, links to prenatal testosterone, biological males castrated at birth and raised as females often still identify and act like males, the underlying traits are highly heritable, and they're exactly what we would predict from an evolutionary psychology perspective. No, I'm not saying that all men differ from women in the following ways, or that these differences are just. And then you put in a nice chart indicating that yeah. the amount of overlap between men and women per trait is greater than the amount of difference. Right, mm -hmm. and so you state that directly. Now, that's, that's perfect. That's a very good way of, of defending your thesis and also of not overstating the case. Then you do a nice job of, of also graphically indicating what happens if the distribution is ignored and people are just treated as if they're unipolar representatives of a given group, which is kind of what the, di what the people who are predicating the push for diversity on gender and race are assuming, right? Yeah. Which is, impl which is really so funny because it's really a biologically essentialist argument, much, much greater than, than, than the argument that you're making, which is that men and women and the members of different races are so different that in order for a full diversity of viewpoint to be achieved, you have to pull in people by race and gender, which, which, which implicitly states that the differences are so great that the distributions don't overlap. Yeah. Right. You couldn't make a more racist and misogynist statement than that. And, it, and it's also technically wrong because men and women are more alike than they are different. Maybe if you summed up all the differences, you could absolutely differentiate between them. You know, in, in all likelihood you could, but some of those differences are clearly irrelevant to the workplace. Yeah. Okay, then you go through the personality difference literature. And you're, you're exactly right on that. I see that the CEO took you to task for using the word neuroticism. However, that is the technical term in the personality literature, and there are historical reasons for that. A, a better word might be negative emotion, but it's clearly the case that women are higher in negative emotion than men, and that means that they are, on average, less tolerant of uncertainty and stress. They suffer more psychologically for, for the equivalent levels of, of uncertainty and stress, and that is also why, cross-culturally, women have more depressive disorders and anxiety disorders. And the research on that is rock solid, rock solid. Men have their own problems, right? They're more likely to be mm -hmm. antisocial. They're much more likely to be imprisoned. They're more likely to have learning disabilities. So it's stating that there are differences in the rates of certain kinds of psychopathologies doesn't put any either gender into a position of relative inferiority. Mm -hmm. So, and then you quote research that suggests that greater nation level gender equality leads to psychological dissimilarity dissimilarity in men and women's personality traits absolutely that's what the scandinavian studies indicate there's been a number mm -hmm. of them and they're very large studies so you got that right what what this what the researchers demonstrated was that as as um, countries move to flatten out the socioeconomic playing field and remove mm -hmm. discrimination. The differences between men and women, or many of the differences between men and women, maximize instead of minimizing. And in Scandinavia, you really see maximization of the difference in men and women with regards to interest in people versus interest in things. A major, a yeah. major issue. Men's higher drive for status. Yeah, well, we know that women are hypergamous and that they choose men on the basis of their socioeconomic status, right? Well documented mm. cross culturally and also just rational because uh, women have to make themselves dependent when they are pregnant and when they have infants. Mm. And it makes perfect sense for them to seek out the most competent person they can manage, the most competent and generous person they can manage in order to help them bear the burden. So, so not, no, no dispute there, at least no, you're not um, diverting from the central tenets of evolutionary 
psychology and biology. People will dispute yeah. those findings, but you're not conjuring this out of thin air. There's a nice solid scientific literature behind you. So, and you know, it's, it's also very interesting to look at the U.S. labor stats on gender differences in occupations, you know, because it's so funny mm -hmm. to watch the radical feminists only go after the high status occupations. Yeah. It's, it's like a hundred percent of bricklayers are men. <laughs> we don't hear that being, being uh, complained about. And of course, men occupy most of the outside jobs. They move more and they do more of the dangerous jobs as well. Um, so, so these are all factors that are, are relevant, but completely undiscussed as far as I can tell by the sort of ideological types that have been going after you. So women are on average more cooperative. Yeah, especially with members of their in-group. Mm -hmm. Whether they're more cooperative with members of their out-group is a different story, right? Because agreeable people are in-group oriented and, and very hard on out-group members, which I think is partly why the PC types are so hard on their enemies, because, you know, yeah. they regard them as predators, predators on infants, essentially, it's something like that. Women, on average, are more prone to anxiety. Yes, that's true. Uh, women, on average, look for more work-life balance. That seems to be the case. I don't know if the literature on that is as tight, you know, but mm. um, it's certainly the case that law firms, for example, have a hell of a yeah. time keeping their women in, in, in partnership positions because most of them don't want to work the 60 hour work weeks, 60 to 80 hour work weeks that are necessary to performance at that extremely high level. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Peterson, for, for anybody who might be new listening in, um, you mentioned that a lot of women might not be, um, you know, interested in working those you know, 60 to 80 hour work weeks. Do you think it would make sense to expand upon that just a little bit? Um, I know you talked through hypergamy, um, but you've also mentioned the thing about why would anybody want to do well, that, that's the, no matter that's what the thing, their gender you know, is. We've got to get the mystery right here. The mystery isn't why there are a bunch of people who are low status, because almost everyone's low status, comparatively speaking, right? Men and women alike. It's a small mm -hmm. minority of people who are high status on any dimension, and they tend to be hyper successful and they tend to be men. So you see this in, in, in scientific publishing, for example. So the median professor, male, publishes as much as the median professor, female. But the vast majority of the high publishing people are males. And that seems to be because there are a small percentage of males who are very status-seeking, very focused, very energetic, and, and very much prone to put their career first. And part of the theory for why that is, is that some men are that, that, that the, the uh, evolutionary and sexual trade-off for men with regards to high status is much higher than it is for women. So there's good mm -hmm. documentation, and I can find these references too, that the number of sexual partners or opportunities that a man has in the previous year is tightly associated with his socioeconomic status, whereas the number of partners or opportunities for partnering that a woman has is negatively correlated with her status. And that might be partly because high status women who are looking for either even higher status men price themselves out of the mating market. And there's actually pretty good documentation of that as well. So, so you're fine. You're fine with all of that. The harm of Google by Google's biases. To achieve a more equal gender and race representation, Google has created several discriminatory practices. Programs, mentoring in classes only for people with a certain gender or race a high priority queue and special treatment for diversity candidates, hiring practices which can effectively lower the bar for diversity candidates by decreasing the false negative rate. Yeah, that's a big problem. You either have standards or you don't. The problem <laughs> is, is that if the standards produce a non-equitable outcome, then what happens is people criticize the standards. And that would be fine if, if the standards bore no relationship to the job. But the problem is, is that if you have your hiring practices set up halfway intelligently, and, and, and it's never perfect, you're actually hiring for attributes that would make uh, job effectiveness much more likely. Yeah. So how did you come across all this information? Uh, part of it was through that diversity summit. And just looking through all the stuff that we have online or in, through our internal sites. Yeah, so you've been doing a fair bit of literature review. Yeah. 
Yeah. These practices are based on false assumptions generated by our biases and can actually increase race and gender tensions. Yeah, well, the whole unconscious bias thing is a great example of that. Is like, first of all, those tests, the implicit association test, are nowhere near reliable or valid enough, so nowhere near the quality necessary to diagnose anyone as having a unconscious bias. Second, second, the data relating those so-called unconscious biases to actual behavior is weak. Third, there's no evidence whatsoever that anti-unconscious bias training programs have any positive effect whatsoever and some that they have negative effect. Part because people don't like to be called racists yeah. and, and marched off to forced re-education training. So, suggestions. Demoralize diversity. Yeah, that would be good. And start to define it more appropriately, right? Yeah. And, and to, to start having a real conversation about what proper hiring practices should be, which should be objective standards, universally applied, without bias. Because that's mm -hmm. the best we can do. That's still going to introduce some non-equal outcomes, but of course hiring practices are designed to do that. For example, yeah. they're clearly designed to reward more intelligent people. <laughs> yeah. Given that IQ is highly heritable, mm -hmm. that's actually a real problem. Yeah, definitely. And we definitely set up hiring practices to reward conscientious people. Mm -hmm. So, and what are, when what about propensity to negative emotion? It seems to me that screening for stress tolerance is a reasonable thing to do in high stress jobs, unless you want to put the person in a position where they're likely to collapse, to be miserable. I don't see any yeah. utility in that. Dr. Peterson, I had a question actually yeah. relating to that. Um, from an employment standpoint, is there an optimum um, sensitivity to stress that you've seen from the most economically productive employees? By that I mean, I feel like there's a middle ground between people who are laid back versus people who are um, probably um, overstimulated by um, external factors that make them self-conscious. And these people, I think, at least at the lower mid-levels of many companies, actually have a little bit more anxiety that powers their ascension through the dominance hierarchy. Yeah, well, it's a tricky issue because you're probably, the sort of negative emotion that might be useful in motivating you is probably more associated with conscientiousness than with neuroticism. Like, neuroticism seems to be linked pretty tightly to anxiety and emotional pain. Frustration, disappointment, grief, those all sort of fit into that, those categories. Whereas the negative emotion, perhaps, that's associated with conscientiousness and, and industriousness in particular seems to be more something like self-contempt and disgust. And so conscientious people are made uncomfortable by their lack of productive effort. But that doesn't seem to be associated with trait neuroticism. It's a different thing. So that's partly why it's so necessary to get the psychometrics right, right, and to get the to get the measurement right. So the best hiring, the best hiring screeners are like a big five personality test, roughly speaking, especially uh, weighted towards conscientiousness, and for complex jobs, a general cognitive ability test. Although there's some question about the legality of those in the current political situation. So. All alienating conservatives is both non-inclusive and generally bad business because conservatives tend to be higher in conscientiousness, which is required for much of the drudgery and maintenance work characteristic of a mature company. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, now here's what you suggest. Confront Google's biases. Well, you've done that, and we've seen how that went. <laughs> I would start by breaking down Googleist scores by political orientation and personality to give a fuller picture into our, how our biases are affecting our culture. That's a fine idea. Stop restricting programs and classes to certain genders or races. Yes, well, obviously. <laughs> Have an open and honest discussion about the costs and benefits of our diversity programs. Well, I guess that's what we're trying to do right now. Discriminating yeah. just to increase the representation of women in tech is as misguided and biased as mandating increases for women's representation in homeless, work-related and violent deaths, prisons and school dropouts. Yes, it's the same thing. And it's the same issue as the bricklayer issue as well. And what are you going to do? You're going to chase the nurses out of, the women out of nursing and medicine <laughs> and psychology and social work and, and university undergraduate programs where they're radically overrepresented? 
So what about Jews? You're going to get rid of them too? <laughs> because they're overrepresented in most complex occupations and Asians as well. So are you only you're only going to do this in very limited circumstances? You're going to figure out some way to put a limit on that, are you? Seems very unlikely. I almost wonder what the ADL is, you know, will be thinking six six months from now or twelve months from now, given the high number of, you know, at least in the United States, um, Ashkenazi Jews in leadership positions at companies that are adv advocating for less of themselves or less people who are in the bucket that they're in. Yeah, well, as long as the discussion centers on the overrepresentation of white men, people seem to have no problem. But you start to break that down a little bit, and because. Uh, Jewish white men are particularly overrepresented. Is what are going to make an issue out of that? Really, we're going to do that? So, and Asians are already having a harder time getting into universities. So, and that's well documented. So, and that that's a terrible thing, partly because of the cost to the individuals involved, but also the cost to society because it means that we're not taking the people who are most competent and allowing them to expand their education to the greatest degree possible. And because there aren't that, like smart, competent people are actually rather rare and it's to society's advantage to exploit the hell out of them and, you know, pay them well for that, but it's not like they're of no benefit. And everyone knows that when they try to hire someone competent. De-emphasize empathy. Yes. Empathy is a good um, ethic for small family units and a terrible ethic to run a company by. It looks like conscientiousness is the right ethic to run a company by. And I think conscientiousness, we don't have good animal models for conscientiousness, eh? but I think conscientiousness probably evolved so that human beings could, could operate in groups that were larger than just kin sized, you know, because uh -huh. equity makes sense at a kin level. Every mother yeah. wants her children to have a good outcome in life and wants resources distributed equally be between them. So it's not like it's something that doesn't have a niche. Micro prioritize intention. Our focus on microaggressions, etc., and other unintentional transgressions increases our sensitivity. You do a nice job of criticizing that. I read Daryl Wing Sue's book on microaggression. It's an appalling, it's an appalling load of tripe, to put it bluntly. And I believe Scott Lilienfeld, who's a very good psychologist, has recently published a paper uh, shredding the the construct validity of the concept of microaggression. So it's a non-valid construct right from the bottom up. It's purely ideological in nature and it's also one of those constructs that allows anyone who's offended to to weaponize their weaponized discourse around it. So yeah. reconsider making unconscious training, bias training mandatory for promotion committees. Yeah, that should be reconsidered. <laughs> it should be stopped. There's no scientific basis whatsoever for proceeding with that operation. So great. Well, you know, it's a pretty straightforward document as far as I'm concerned, and I've gone through it with a fairly fine-tooth comb as a behavioral scientist, and I would like to state for the record that I believe that what you said in there, if not accurate, was at least representative of the current state of art among well-trained, psychometrically um, uh, informed psychologists who are experts in the field of individual difference. So, congratulations. Too Thanks. bad you had to pay such a price for it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for the conversation. Ah, one yeah. other question. Why did you agree to talk to me? I, I'm a huge fan, so... <laughs> and well, I know that you went be, through a similar thing. Being any influence on, <laughs> on this. I mean, you're going to pay a... Actually, I'm not. Sorry. <laughs> I'd like to say I was sorry, but I'm not. I'm actually really pleased. I, I do think that you're going to be a, pay a big price for this, but that the net consequence will be very positive. And I'm, I, I think you did an excellent job on this document. I think you were very careful. I think the fact that you're being labeled with epithets and that you were fired is absolutely reprehensible. You know, yeah. it's clear to me that you're just trying to figure out what the hell's going on and that, you know, you're not... You're not any of the things that people would like to think you are so that they don't have to bloody well think about what it is that you said and did. So, like, congratulations to you, man. Courageous people are rare, and you put yourself on the line. And I've really learned that in the last year. So, mm -hmm. 
I would say keep your head up. Assume that this is going to work out. It, I wouldn't hide from the press because I think the press is actually, you're the right kind of person for the press to be uh, something for you to use. You know, you're well spoken, you're quiet, you're, you're, you're convincing, you're rational. Um, you're obviously, at least you come across as a decent guy very, very rapidly. Um, there's no reason, I would say there's no reason not to let people see who you are, because I think that would improve your credibility and make your message even more powerful. So you think about that. I mean, you're, you are, have every right to defend your privacy, you know, but, yeah. I, and, and that's fine. But I don't think that you have any reason to be afraid of the press. I would say a couple of things when you're talking to the press. Don't apologize. Mm -hmm. Don't tell people what you're not. Don't tell them that you're not yeah. a bigot and that you're not a misogynist. That's a technical error. Um, and stick to your damn guns, you know, as, as, as quietly and forthrightly as you can. And man, you're going to come out on top of this because you're, you're on the side of the right as far as I'm concerned.